I invite the congregation to stand as you're able and turn to face the entrance to the sanctuary where the baptismal font is located as we begin our time together this morning with the thanksgiving for baptism that you see on your, in your bulletin or as you see it on the screen. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah! In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For this saving mystery and for this water, let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for your river of life flowing freely from your throne, through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with mercy and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gate of righteousness and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places you're with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst, cleanse our hearts, wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. We sing together, Christ is Alive. Let Christians sing hymn number 389. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Yes. 
For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing and honor and glory and might be to be with you. Prayer of the day for this fifth Sunday of Easter is found printed in your bulletin. You'll also see it on the screen. We pray together. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, you teach us that without love, our actions gain nothing. Pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, that made alive by your Spirit, we may know goodness and peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, our children's ministry director, Beth, has a word uh, to deliver through our video screen today, so I turn it over to Beth. Good morning, everyone. Well, have you ever played this game? It's called Guess Who, and by asking yes or no questions, you try to figure out what the other player, or I guess I should say, who the other player in the game is. So if this were part of the game, then we would say, um, you have to ask yes or no questions. So you would say, are you a girl? No. So we knock down the girl. Let's see, do you have white hair? No. Do you wear glasses? No. Do you wear a hat? No. So then we know that Justin here is the other player's person. It's kind of a fun game. So now I'm gonna play a little different guessing game with you. Um, I'm gonna give you some clues and you see if you can figure out who I'm talking about, okay? So here's the first one. They give food to hungry people and water to thirsty people. They welcome the stranger. They give clothing to people who need it. They help people who are sick and they visit people who are in prison. They love their neighbor. They help people in need, even if they don't know them. They pray. They tell others about Jesus and they let their light shine. Did you guess who? I bet you did. I'm giving you clues about um, people who follow Jesus. So both of these guessing games made me think about our gospel reading for today, and it's from John 13, 31 through 35. Jesus was teaching his friends, the disciples, and he was getting ready to go up to heaven, and he wanted them to be ready for that when he would leave. So he told them, you can't go where I'm going, but when I leave, I want you to love others as I have loved you. 
then they will know that you are my disciples. Jesus says that when we love others like he loved others, they will know he is our friend. So this week, let's pray about how we can live our lives so that others can see that we are Jesus's friends and then they won't have to guess who we are. Did you see what I did there? <laughs> All right, let's get ready to pray. We'll fold our hands and bow our heads. God, we want others to know we're Jesus's friends. Help us to love others like Jesus loved. And all of God's children say, Amen. Well, this morning, I want to say a great big congratulations to all of our high school graduates that we're celebrating today. Um, I wish you just all the best in your future. God bless you and keep you on your journey ahead. Come back and see us a lot, often, as often as you can. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you all next time. The first reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, the 11th chapter. It can be found on page 895 of your Pew Bible. In defense of his earlier baptism of non-Jewish believers, Peter demonstrates to the members of the Jerusalem church that God's intention to love Gentiles as well as Jews is revealed in Jesus' testimony. In this way, the mission to the Gentiles is officially authorized. The reading. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord. For nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send a Joppa and bring Simon, who's called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord.
The second lesson is from the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter. It can be found on page 1007 of your pew Bible. John's vision shows us that in the resurrection, the new age has dawned. God dwells with us already, yet we wait for the time when the tears that cloud our vision will be wiped away. Then we will see the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. The reading. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks. I invite you to stand as you're able for the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, 
and will glorify Him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You'll look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you can't come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I've read that text at more funerals than I can even begin to count, and you can probably guess why. Um, I think we love it for its beautiful words of promise of things being made new. You know, things being put right, put back together, a new heaven and a new earth where mourning and crying and pain will be no more. Mm. I found myself wishing that very thing this weekend again as the news of another mass shooting comes to us, this one from Buffalo, New York. A young man about the same age as our high school graduates that we honor here this morning drove two hours from his home and slaughtered ten people, apparently in an act of racially motivated hatred and destruction. How could you not yearn for a new heavens and a new earth? An end to suffering, to mourning and crying and pain. But more than that, even more than that, there's some words at the end of the first verse of that 21st chapter of Revelation that I think we often miss. They're easy to kind of skip right over. And the sea was no more. The sea was no more. Hmm. For the first century people living in Israel, you know that the sea represented chaos, right? It was a dangerous place, a place fraught with danger. You might have gone out on that sea in little fishing boats, but you didn't get very far from shore. Not if you wanted to preserve your life, because storms could come up mighty fast. This was the days before Norwegian cruise lines and all that. You just didn't ply the seas, you know. You stayed pretty close to shore. And think about the first chapter of Genesis in the Bible, when the writer is trying to imagine pre-creation. What was it? It was this watery mess that covers the face of the deep. And finally, God calls into being land. You know, to get a safe place, a solid place in the midst of that wet, watery chaos. But it wasn't just chaos and danger that the seas represented. It was distance, right? Distance between us and whoever was living on the other side of that sea, the other side of that ocean, us and them. Distance. Hmm. John's vision and revelation then imagines a new creation, a new reality in which all that separation has been taken away. Things are brought together. Now, that's a vision. That's a vision. Huh? Last week at our lunch at the living room Bible study on Thursday, a few of us were thinking together about how often um, the things we hang on to from our immigrant past, even in our churches, served to separate us one from another. And we got to thinking about some of those things that we just kind of take for granted when our ancestors came over to this nation. Um, language certainly was one of those things that separated people one from another. Um, we tended to go into our own enclaves where they spoke our language. And in fact, the church of, churches of my youth um, weren't that far removed from their Norwegian speaking days in, in church. You spoke English out there in the world, right? But when you came to worship, oftentimes the sermons were and the liturgy was in the mother tongue, as it were, right? But I remember reading a, a, a study by the Cato Institute a few years ago that studied Spanish-speaking immigrants coming to our country and how long it takes folks to kind of shed their old language. And in their study, they said approximately 35% of new immigrants learn the new language 
within their lifetime. And by the second generation, it's up to over 90%. By third generation, forget it, it's done. So language as a barrier is often one of those things that's crossed pretty quick. Then there's fashion. You know, we bring our fashions from wherever we are, what we wear. Um, but those tend to go away pretty fast, too, because there's that desire to assimilate, to, to kind of move in the, new, in the new and leave the old behind. I lived in La Crosse, Wisconsin for five years before I came to this area. And that, of course, is filled with the progeny of German-speaking immigrants, right? These were Germans. But in all my time there, I don't ever recall once seeing someone wear lederhosen or a dirndl to work, right? You saw them once a year, one week out of the year at Oktoberfest, and they were probably holding a mug, <laughs> you know, when they were dressed that way. And even amongst, you know, the, um, the Norwegian folks that I kind of grew up around in those communities, no one was wearing bunas or anything like that, except once a year, you know, maybe at the Nordic Fest celebration or at the Yule Fest, you know what I'm saying, right? Those fashion things get put aside pretty fast. But then there's food. Mm. <laughs> food is another matter altogether, right? Our gastronomical proclivities we seem to hang on to a lot more stubbornly than anything else. You may only see later hosen uh, one week out of the year in La Crosse, but you can get genuine, good, real German bratwurst and hot German potato salad all year long if you're looking for it in La Crosse, right? Our family cookbooks are testament to it. Hmm? They are encyclopedias of our past and comfort in our present, and we don't want our diets messed with. And that's interesting. And so it was most certainly with the folks that we meet in the Bible. Hmm? One of the defining characteristics of the nation of Israel was their dietary restrictions laid out for them in places like the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, right? Generation after generation of these dietary laws passed down, and it wasn't simply for health reasons that they ate the way they did. There were defining characteristics in their diet, determining what was clean, what was kosher, and what was unclean, right? It was a form of identification, so no matter where they were, no matter if they had been taken away into exile into a foreign country or had been overtaken by uh, invading hordes like the Assyrians, like the Babylonians, like the Romans, they held on to that identity fiercely, and it was there in their dietary laws. And so it was that Peter, one of the first apostles, finds himself in non-Jewish territory, compelled by God's Holy Spirit to to go visit a man named Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and invite him into the household of faith in Jesus. That was our first reading from Acts today. And I think it's kind of fascinating how the Spirit directs Peter to do this very thing, to go into this foreign man's, not only into his town, but into his house and eat with him. Peter has a vision, a dream goes straight to the heart of one of the biggest cultural barriers preventing a visit like this ever taking place. He sees a sheet lowered from heaven, right? And it's on this sheet are all of these unclean critters, right? Hogs and birds of prey, things that they weren't supposed to eat. And a voice coming, Peter, go ahead and dig in. <laughs> Kill and eat. Peter says, absolutely, by no means. I've kept kosher laws ever since I was... You know, ever since I was born, I can't do that. Go ahead. What God has made clean, you can't call unclean. Hmm. And it's immediately after this vision that some ser servants come to Peter from their master, Cornelius, explaining that their master had a vision telling him that he needed to send for a guy named Peter in Joppa who had a message for him and for his whole, whole household that would lead to life. And so Peter goes with them. And he crosses the threshold of this Gentile home, and he breaks bread with this guy. Crossing cultural barriers and breaking down walls. And all of a sudden, the sea was no more. The sea was no more. There's a mutuality taking place in this story. It's too easy to miss, okay? It's not just a faithful disciple of Jesus swallowing his pride to sit down with the quote-unquote, unclean for the purpose of giving him a, a gift of salvation, bestowing it on a needy heathen. Huh? No, it works both ways. 
It's two guys crossing oceans of cultural boundaries to receive the other as a brother. Both of them together. And something new is born. When my dad took a call in 1980, we moved from North Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul. His church was Christ Lutheran on Capitol Hill. And that was an old congregation of the old Norwegian Lutheran Synod. So it was very kind of high church, very stately, you know, and very liturgical. And back in the day, it had a hundred voice choir, right? And there were over a thousand folks that came into that sanctuary every weekend for worship. That was back in like the 50s. By the 1980s, 1980 is when we got there, there were maybe a hundred in worship on a Sunday, and that was on a good day, right? And so many had left the downtown area, so many of the old Norwegian Lutherans, right? They, they went to the suburbs. But that church was right on the boundary of what is known as the Mount Airy Housing District in downtown St. Paul. And at that time, it was being filled by immigrants who were from Southeast Asia. Laos, right? These uh, Hmong folks from Laos, guy, people who had fought alongside U.S. troops in Vietnam, but now were being systematically hunted down by the Viet Cong for their, you know, what they regarded as traitorous behavior. They were being hunted down, so many of them were coming over here. And then Cambodian refugees who were fleeing the killing fields of Pol Pot still in 1980. And uh, the congregation had tried to reach out to that community um, not very successfully. It you know, did try to do everything. Even sponsored several of these families to get them established, get them set up, work with social services to get them, you know, connected with things and find jobs and all of that. Um, and there were a few families that were there, but by and large, things never really kind of took off. And my dad could sense this big cultural barrier. And it was. I mean, let's face it. Language, dress, but diet as well. So dad decided to try something new. So one day he came home and he informed us, and by us I mean the kids, um, that we were going over to somebody's house to eat. We knew the kids in that house, Chang and Na. They were coming to youth group pretty regularly. They were high school age. But their parents hardly ever darkened the door because they just didn't feel comfortable, you know? Not only going to worship in a language they didn't understand, but they didn't really have much desire to come to the potlucks either and eat, you know, tomato hot dish and, <laughs> you know, scalloped potatoes and ham. It wasn't their thing. So Dad said, we're going over to their house to eat. And he informed us, and by informed, I mean commanded, that we would eat whatever was put in front of us. <laughs> and if you know anything about my diet, yeah... <laughs> I am not a veggie eater, right? And I, oh man, I was not looking forward to this night. And when we were walking up the steps into their, to their house, my nose was telling me already this was going to be a challenge no matter what. But we sat down at the table with them and the egg rolls that we got to start the meal were the best egg rolls I've ever had in my life. They were filled with this pork, you know, and shredded carrots and a little bit of cabbage, but not so much. You could sneak it by a vet, you know, a guy like me. And they were wonderful. They were awesome. And then they put out the, the fish bowl soup was next, or the fish ball soup was next. So I'd stuff my face with these egg rolls and then kind of sneak this deadly broth behind them, you know, and choke it all down as I could. But we survived. And after a few weeks, Cheng and Na's folks started coming to worship with them. And they've started bringing a few of their contemporaries along too, folks who were their age, probably, you know, that mid-40-ish age. They started showing up too. And it changed the whole character of that place pretty soon. All of a sudden, things got a lot noisier on Sunday morning because they weren't used to going to worship and being quiet. When they went to a Buddhist temple in Laos or Cambodia, that was a place to visit. You brought your offering, you put it down in front of the altar, and then you visited with your friends. So the sermon time was a challenge for Dad. He'd be up there preaching, and they'd be leaning over the pews, talking to each other and whatnot. And it was all right. It was just beautiful. And then pretty soon, and this was the real telling thing in that congregation, pretty soon they started holding joint egg roll and lefsa making clinics in the basement where they taught each other how to cook each other's food, you know? And things started to change 
and the sea was no more. I don't want to say that all divisions were wiped away because they certainly weren't. There were still all of those challenges. But getting over that gastronomical boundary was huge. And all of a sudden, people started to see each other. Eh, they're just folks, you know, and they've got good food and they've got good food. And yeah, we should learn how to do that. And all of a sudden, the sea was no more. I think that this is both challenge and promise that God's Holy Spirit has for us in the post-Easter church that we are a part of. To go where we otherwise wouldn't go. Hmm? To eat what we otherwise would not eat. But most of all, to receive what we otherwise would have missed. The difference. The new. The message of love and salvation in Jesus Christ, death's defeat, I believe 100% is loose in the world. It is. It's loose. New heavens and new earth are being born all the time. The last ocean to cross, the last barrier, is the hardness of our own hearts and the blindness of our own eyes. That's it. But even then, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. We've got people like our high school graduates going out into the world. You guys have eyes to see things in a new way, open to crossing oceans, breaking down barriers. The sea might be no more. Wouldn't that be something? That's a vision to shoot for. Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing together hymn number 650, In Christ There Is No East or West. We confess our faith this morning in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today we have the privilege of honoring, recognizing, blessing our our graduating high school seniors for this year. You have an insert in your bulletin that looks like this with the names and pictures of many of them there. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to just read through the names real quickly. And as you hear your name called, if you're here with us at this service, please come forward and just come to the rail, okay? Kellen Bogard, Gabe Fieser, 
Mikhail Fisher, McKenna Eide, Ethan Johnson, Amelia Klug, Peyton Millis, Avery Murray, Leith Sandness, Carly Schenk. We also have Ashton Koval, Miranda Newmiller, Kendall Olness, and Brady Sprait. So we've got a good group here at this service. Wonderful. You guys ready to graduate? More than ready. <laughs> I, know, I know how it is at this stage. Um, for most of you, it was probably somewhere between 17 and 18 years ago that you were brought to a baptismal font like the one back there. And when that happened, promises were made to you, okay? Promises by God that you would be his child forever. And when you were brought to the font, we prayed a special blessing over you that day. And what we prayed is for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be stirred up inside of you, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and might, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, a spirit of joy in his presence. It was the very same blessing we prayed over you about four years ago when you were standing up here and you were all wearing your uh, confirmation stoles. I see you guys got them. Very nice. But to remind you of the fact that you are God's beloved, right? This is all your parents have ever wanted for you. It's all any of us have wanted for you, that you might know who you are, that you were created by God to be loved and then to go out into the world and love. Now as you stand at this turning point in your life, ready to go out, leave your parents' home, leave your parents' home, <laughs> eventually, eventually, maybe it'll take a couple more years, that's all right, but when you go out into the wider world, now to share your belovedness with everybody else, and as I mentioned in the sermon, I'm hopeful because I know that you'll do that very thing, but as we bless you, and pray for you, know that you go with the love of all these people, and the one who loves you better than your mom and dad ever could, the one who made you, his love goes with you too. So I'm going to ask us now to uh, bow our heads, and we'll pray a prayer of blessing over these graduates. So let us pray. Gracious Lord God, as these young men and women stand poised here looking into the future, we ask that you let no fear overwhelm them. Let no vain and empty dreams capture them, no selfish ambitions ensnare them. Help them to be confident that you'll be with them in whatever future, just like you've been with them all their life. We know that faith is no insurance policy against trouble, but rather that we know that you'll be with us in whatever trouble. So give them strong hearts, confident faith, knowing that as long as you are beside them, loving them, fear can never have them. Bless each one of these young people as they try to live like faithful men and women, where they are inclined to be satisfied with themselves as they are. Make them willing to be changed. When they find themselves being swallowed up by schedules and responsibilities, teach them the discipline and gift of Sabbath rest. Hear us as we pray now for these who are standing on the threshold of time. You alone can equip them for the tasks and duties that are theirs, that they might do their very best with this precious life. We pray this in Jesus' name, knowing that you hear us. Amen. I now invite the congregation to stand as we join with our graduates in prayer for all of God's people. Loving God, lead us to follow your spirit rather than our own desires as the church cares for one another. Open us to perceive your gifts in every single one. Bless each of the graduates honored this month. Guide their path and fill them with your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Inspire us to praise you through the beauty and majesty of the natural world around us. Urge us toward more deliberate care of the world you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Humble the rulers of nations before your splendor. Direct them to the people who need their attention most and turn them from the temptation to hoard wealth or power. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hasten to dwell among those who are in pain or distress. 
We bring to you especially today Grayley, Mark, Jerry, and those we hold in our hearts. As Christ enters our deepest suffering, remain with those experiencing illness, despair, and great need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Place holy love at the center of all of our relationships and communities. By your love, heal us, convict us, and renew us. Bring an end to division in our churches and communities. Let everyone know your goodness by the love we show one another. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us a place in the diverse company of your beloved saints. We remember today the Tatro and Little families at the death of loved ones, Tiffany Nycastle and Pat Little. Teach us the value of each person's identity and bless us with a shared identity as your children, kindred of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you guys turn around and face the congregation? Would you guys bless them with some love at their, uh, the stepping stone in their life? The peace of the Lord be with you always. And always. Share a sign of peace with those around you in worship this morning. We're going to sing a hymn for our graduates as we get ready for the offering today. Hymn number 732, I Was There to Hear Your Morning Cry. As we receive the offering this morning, a reminder that all the monies that kids bring up and put in the Love Your Neighbor jar during these Sundays of May are going to support the Wombly Ska Center, which is a youth ministry of Wayatan Lutheran Church, our Lakota Lutheran ministry in downtown Rapid City. So I thank you in advance for your support that way. We receive the morning offering.
I invite you to stand as you're able for our offertory hymn. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you bless us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We invite all who have worshipped with us this morning, who believe Jesus present in the bread and wine of this supper with love and mercy, for you to come forward and commune with us today or to come forward for a blessing. We invite you to pick up a cup from one of the trays in the center aisle as you come forward, unless you desire grape juice instead of the wine. The grape juice has already been poured for you up in front. Just ask and you'll receive that. We also have gluten-free wafers available for those for whom that is a need. Again, just ask and you'll receive. For those of you who are worshiping with us at home, know that the bread and wine on your home altar are the body and blood of Jesus given and shed for you. The table is set. Let us eat and drink and be blessed together.
I invite you to stand as you're able to receive the blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us again through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, now strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you with us this morning, and fun to celebrate our graduating high school seniors. Uh, lots of folks graduating this time of year, of course. Black Hill State already had their graduation uh, a couple weeks ago. No, last weekend. It was, seems like a couple weeks ago. And lots of colleges have been, have been having commencement exercises, and so we celebrate with all those who are making these big steps in their, in their life together. We have a little breakfast plan for those that can stay uh, of our high school graduates and families back into the fellowship hall. Join us then after this service for that. Just a couple of very brief announcements. Um, number one, today is our Adopt a Highway Cleanup Day, and the Vanscos are kind of heading that up, and anybody who would like to join them. Um, George, are you back there in the fellowship hall? Get on here for a quick minute. He's got his vest on already, so you see him. You can talk to him, and uh, they'll be leaving about, they want to gather here about quarter to one. Is that correct, George? Quarter to one today, and just to pick up our section of highway, Interstate 90, between exits 8 and 10. So uh, join us for that. Wear boots for that deal. Um, there's some pews over here in the front that hardly ever get sat in, the first two. Um, and we've actually got a plan to occupy some of that space. We've been doing a lot of uh, thinking about uh, how to best minister to some of our younger members. You saw some of them here this morning bringing up offering at, during the offering time, Love Your Neighbor Jar. Um, we're thinking of putting in something we call a playground, which is basically an area with a couple of very small tables and chairs and some uh, activities for kids to do where parents of those kids can sit in the pew right behind them and they'd be up in this area here so they're engaged in what's going on in the worship. But they can be keeping themselves occupied as well. Um, it's a fun idea that we've seen other congregations have a lot of success with and you'll be hearing more about that. We'll be getting a picture board together of what that might look like in the coming weeks. So pay attention, stay tuned for that. You'll be reading more about it in the next newsletter. Um, but we think it'll be a wonderful addition to our children's ministry. So um, is there anything else that I am? I'm just going to look here to make sure I'm not skipping something. Next Sunday, we will be receiving new members into the life of our congregation. And we do have a little gathering on Thursday night, a little dinner at about 545 for all those who are going to be new to our family of faith here. And if we don't know that you're interested in becoming part of that group, let us know. Or just show up, too. You can do that, too. But we'd love to know who is coming so we can expect you. Um, but we've got a nice little group of new members joining us. And so that's this Thursday night, and we receive them on Sunday of next week. I think that's probably enough for announcements. You can read the rest in your bulletin as you're able. Let's stand up and let's sing ourselves out of worship this morning by singing hymn number 660, Lift High the Cross.
peace to love and serve the Lord.